So I'm thinking, I'm a Soviet specialist, 26 years in the Army, six years at the Reagan White House. I'm interviewing for... Welcome to Meet the Voter, episode 42, sponsored by the Republican Men's Club of Northern Nevada, RMC. On today's episode, we'll be interviewing Dr. Ty Cobb, who is a native from Reno, Nevada, graduated from University of Nevada, Reno, and then found himself in Vietnam as a young officer. Later in life, he would receive his MA from Indiana University and his PhD from Georgetown University, then serve as a key figure in foreign affairs and national security during the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Now, without further ado, let's get right into this episode of Meet the Voter. Today, we have Dr. Ty Cobb here in Reno, Nevada, who will be speaking at the RMC's September dinner on the 19th. Dr. Cobb, welcome to Meet the Voter, sponsored by the RMC. Great to be here and have a chance to talk about global events. Right. And um, what will we be talking about at the dinner? Uh, The focus is going to be on what is going on in Russia with uh, Vladimir Putin. And we'll be asking the question, whether Russia, whether Putin? Uh, But we're also going to take a look at other major developments in the international arena, which would include the challenges from China in the South China Sea to our navigation in that area and uh, the continuing conflict with North Korea and whether or not that'll lead to a missile exchange with nuclear warheads. Nice topics. Those are, uh, it's a very dangerous world right now. It is, and we haven't even mentioned the Middle East. (laughs) Now, you started back in 1962 as a second lieutenant. Right. Went to UNR right here? I graduated from Nevada as a second lieutenant, was uh, commissioned in the air defense artillery, actually went on active duty in February of uh, 1963, and was deployed, uh, assigned to Italy, uh, in a role where we maintained control of nuclear warheads, but I was assigned to an Italian Air Force unit. Okay, in Italy. Nice. Yes, in Italy, and they you see they had the Nike Hercules missiles, um, but the Americans kept control of the nuclear warheads until they were released by the president to allies. And so, up until that point, we controlled them. Uh, when the release order came in a state of war, we would mate the warhead onto the Italian uh, air defense missiles, the Nike Hercules system, um, and then they would f- fly the actual. F- uh, contest against the in- invading aircraft. I, I think that might have been a nice assignment, but I know anything to do with nuclear usually is not nice. <laughs> you well, you know, being in northern Italy, we were uh, stationed near the uh, nor- on the north side of the Bay of Venice. My girlfriend came over from Reno. We got married in Venice, and uh, we certainly enjoyed that. The but you're in a high tension atmosphere. W- worried about the control of nuclear weapons and the possibility that at which point would they be transferred to the Italian Air Force. Right. No, any, anything to do with nuclear weapons, I wanted to get as far away as I could yeah, as a young officer. That was good Good advice. Because I know the war stories. You can actually lose. I think more people get in trouble around nuclear weapons about losing their commission or their career yes, than uh, any place else. I know in the Army, at least. <laughs> so going ahead, now, you had a great career, and you ended up at West Point as a professor. Well, after Vietnam, I went, or after uh, Italy, uh, I went to Vietnam, my, my first tour, and I was an advisor in the Delta uh, with the South Vietnamese regional and popular force troops for the most part. And uh, after that, I began training to be a foreign area specialist uh, in the Soviet field. And so the uh, Army sent me to language school, Monterey Graduate School for a master's degree, and then two years in a simulated environment learning uh, uh, much about the Russian-Soviet political and military systems. Following that, now that I'm a certified Soviet specialist, the Army, in all its wisdom, sends me back to Vietnam (laughs) for another tour. FAO program, that's a a good program. That's That's a very interesting program. The FAO, yeah, Foreign Area Officer Program. That's a lot of uh, interesting things to get to do. So going out, how do you end up at West Point as a professor? Uh, after I <clears throat> came back from uh, Vietnam, I was the Army is going to utilize me. I went to the Pentagon uh, in Army intelligence. Uh, that's not a contradiction in terms, you know. And uh, I worked there on uh, high-level strategic intelligence issues. While I was there, um, I had been in contact with West Point. The Department of Social Sciences wanted me to come there to teach. So after going to Command and General Staff College, I went to West Point. 
as an instructor, I think while you were there for three years, and you were fortunate, you you <laughs> you, you didn't you managed not to take my course. Um, and then I became what was a tenured pr- uh, professor at West Point for the last three, and I was teaching primarily specialty courses relating to the Soviet Union. Now, as a tenure, were you branched? Did you wear the branch at West Point? Then? Yeah, you still did. Yeah, uh, you wore that branch until you were uh, head of the uh, department. You still were uh, branch specific. Interesting. And so I, I was wearing military intelligence. Oh, am I? So you did transfer yeah. truly. I, I had switched to uh, military intelligence from artillery prior to my second tour in Vietnam. So when I went back for my second tour in Vietnam, I wound up in uh, J2 headquarters at, at MACV in Saigon. Uh, initially, while the war was still going on, got more interesting because on January 26, 1973, the peace treaty was signed in Paris. And uh, the <clears throat> the general, uh, uh, actually General uh, Wickham, a uh, one-star at the time, called me in and said, Major Cobb, they're signing the peace treaty in Paris tomorrow. And I said, yes, sir, I'd heard that. Why is he telling me this? And he said, the peace treaty requires <clears throat> that the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong delegations come to Saigon, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong delegation, the day after the ceasefire is signed, and uh, come to Saigon, and they're going to begin observing the peace, implementation of the peace treaty. And I said, wow, still, why is he telling me this? And he said, and it requires an American officer to be in charge of all of this, and that be you. (laughs) So I was in charge of bringing the uh, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong representatives who came in from Paris into Saigon and then helping them deploy to observation posts throughout the country. Well, that's, uh, that's as a major, that's a lot of responsibility. One thing about the military is when you're young, right. you get a tremendous amount of responsibility. Uh, it really was. And, and Bill, that last, the peace treaty said all American troops had to be out in 60 days. So we only had two months to get the uh, uh, observation sites set up uh, which meant that the South Vietnamese had to work with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, which was not easy because they'd been at war the day before. And now they're working together to observe the implementation of the ceasefire. But in, in addition to this, we had to get all of the rest of the American troops out. We began the uh, exfiltration of our POWs out of Hanoi, out of the Hanoi Hilton that next day. And I went uh, I, I went up to Hanoi. I was the first American to go to Hanoi after the peace treaty. And we started uh, the process by which the American prisoners of war were uh, liberated. I remember watching the pictures of the C-141s. Uh, with- yes. They, they took them out of uh, Hanoi directly to the Philippines, um, where they were given food and clothing and a chance to relax and then brought home to meet their loved ones. And they began exfiltrating the uh, POWs by it, the length of time they'd been there. So those, I think, Admiral had been there eight years, right. uh, who was the first to leave. Yeah. And then uh, we, uh, within the 60-day period, we had gotten all of the prisoners exchanged. The, the North Vietnamese held South Vietnamese as well. The Viet Cong held South Vietnamese. The South Vietnamese had uh, 100,000 uh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese prisoners out on an island. All of those ex- uh, transfers had to be done within that 60-day period. We accomplished that. We got all the American troops out, and on the 61st day we left, we were the last Americans to leave the war zone. I don't think I've ever seen the Army move that fast without I know. big a mass. I know what it's like in Afghanistan. I can imagine. Right, yeah. Uh, that that seemed to me it would just leave a collapse possible. I mean, There were so many things could have gone wrong. I was in Kuwait on the board. I saw the yeah. last troops come out of Kuwait, and we all knew it was going to collapse. Did you think the same thing? I mean, 75, well, a few well, years that's later. Well, that's a good point. Here's what I saw in that. Uh, my boss on the implementation of the ceasefire team uh, was a Marine colonel, Balsar. And we were watching this process unfold, and the North Vietnamese were very disciplined, and they followed orders. The Viet Cong, a little less disciplined, and kind of would go this way or that. South Vietnamese were completely screwed up uh, fighting each other and just no one was really taking charge. And the colonel, the Marine colonel, looked at this and he said, you know, this reminds me of like one of those boat boat races. They have the skulls. 
And he said, here's the North Vietnamese boat, one coxswain, 20 guys rowing in unison, and they're moving along. Here's the Viet Cong boat, one coxswain, but they're missing an oar here and there, and they kind of go like this, but they're going in the right direction. He said, then here's the South Vietnamese boat, eight coxswains, one guy rowing, and it's going round and round in circles. And by the end of the 60-day period, it was pretty clear that the South Vietnamese were not organized to take advantage of the peace process. And the North Vietnamese were just patiently waiting for us to leave. That's, uh, but it did take a few years after that. No, I mean, two, two years. Two, well, two years, right. Yeah, we, uh, uh, I remember when uh, <clears throat> one time a famous exchange, one of my cohorts, Colonel Harry Summers, the uh, military historian, was talking to his pa- ca- counterpart, also a Colonel North Vietnamese. Colonel Summers said to Colonel Dien, Colonel Dien, you know your troops, North Vietnamese troops, never once defeated American troops in battle. The North Vietnamese colonel said, ah, yes, Colonel, that is correct, but it's irrelevant. That's true. You're That's leaving, true. and we're here. <laughs> See ya. Lost the battles, won the war in the long uh, run. Yeah, and what happened, we had to be out by April 1st. We, that was the date the last of us left. Um, I was too junior to be the last guy to leave, but I carefully stayed on the plane when we landed at Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska till everybody got off so I could say, I'm the last soldier back from Vietnam. So, that's pretty... That's which has the added value of being the truth. <laughs> so you stayed at Elmendorf very long. It's one of my favorite places. Uh, no, we we, we, uh, we landed there, called our girlfriend's wives yeah. and, and all, and then uh, we, we flew to Travis. What an interesting where, time. Where my wife <clears throat> picked me up. That's interesting. Now, now somehow you get into West Point to become an instructor. Yes, af- after uh, my uh, intelligence, strategic intelligence assignment at the Pentagon, I was asked to be uh, an instructor at West Point. At the time, you were a cadet. I uh, loved that and wound up being asked to be a, stay there as a tenured professor. So I stayed there, and at the end of six years, um, uh, I had been consulting with the National Security Council in the White House under President Carter. When uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was the national security advisor, Professor Sam Huntington was on there, General Bill Odom. And I had been uh, consulting on Soviet issues with Sam Huntington. And then the Carter administration ended. I continued that relationship with the new Reagan team, and I I knew pretty well. And uh, after two years, they asked me if I would come down on on a two-year break from West Point, and I did. And... At the end of the two years, things were finally breaking loose with the Soviet Union. We now had Gorbachev in power. The old Brezhnevs were dead and, and, and drove up and they were gone. So they said, can you stay a third year? And I, I got permission to stay a third year. But after that, West Point said, you either come back or, or resign your professorship. So I stayed on in the Reagan NSC, uh, but I'm still on active duty for a while as a colonel. Right, they left you on to terminate. Yeah, I I've had that something similar to that to have me on a different program where they call you back. They said yeah, one yeah. branch is controlling me, and I said I'm gonna. Well, stay that's here. that's a good point. I didn't know who was really controlling yeah. me, um, but I did get over and uh, actually it was General Wickham, but now he's a four star. Right, and I, generals can do anything. Uh, and, <laughs> Just and he's the chief of staff of the army, and and I was over the Pentagon and talk about what I was going to do. And I said, I'm kind of waiting for instructions from you. And he said, Ty, right now you work for the President of the United States, not the U.S. Army. That's where you take your orders. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. And I st- yeah. uh, what happened is then Colin Powell came over as the National Security Advisor. And uh, I was in the process of being promoted to a very high position. And Colin Powell was on active duty, so he was conscious of having too many active duty people in senior positions. So he said to me, Ty, I understand you've been thinking about getting out of the Army. And I said, yes, sir, I'd given it some thought. He said, good, how about tomorrow? (laughs) (laughs) No. Yes, and within a week I was a civilian. Terminal leave and all that? Uh, No, no no time for that. Um, uh, I just... How many years... uh, 26. 20, or, that's a lot of years. That's a lot and of years. it was convenient, but you know, normally that takes a lot of time. And well, the National Security Advisor called the Army, asked them to expedite it. And within six days, I, I was a civilian. So I was now Dr. Cobb and not Colonel. So were you, you were a G, uh, 
GS some sort of rating? Uh, yeah, I think I was a 15, GS2. 16, something like that. Yeah, 15 is as high as it goes right it, now. Then it, you go SCS1. Yeah, I was not right. SCS. It didn't 15. It didn't really matter. In those days, my pay was, was was structured so that I really didn't get paid if I, I i couldn't get my retirement pay and and be and be paid yeah that. they had the rules were different back then they yeah, were they changed yeah man uh so it was rather immaterial but yeah. the the key point is when the uh end of the reagan administration came on uh, january 26 reagan's on stage at the down at the, in front of the uh, uh, congress on the uh, grounds and uh, reagan salutes and uh, goes off and gets in a chopper, and George H. W. Bush is sworn in. And at that point, I, w- I was no longer employed by the government. <laughs> January twentieth, uh, nineteen eighty-nine. So things changed, right? At twelve right. o'clock, uh, I was uh, because I was a political appointee, mm-hmm. not uh, professional staff, and right. So I uh, I was unemployed at that as of that moment. <laughs> That's the way it goes. What did you do after? That tour. It was really interesting. I, I just wanted, you know, it had been so intense at the Reagan White House for six years. And I just wanted to relax for a few weeks. And then I got a call from an odd place. Because I, uh, I assumed that I would wind up, I wanted to go west and, you know, with one of the uh, Rand, probably, mm-hmm. or, or, or maybe Sandia uh, defense contractors. But I got a call from the Center for Naval Analyses, and they called me up, and I interviewed, and they offered me a very senior position. And I said, you know, I don't know anything about the Navy, and I, I do global only stuff, and you guys really don't. Rand does, but you don't. And they said, we know. We, we need to do more strategic uh, thinking. And um, <clears throat> so I became a senior, a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for Naval Analyses for four years, which absolutely enjoyed. And then in 1995, my wife and I said, We've, we have got to go back home west. Let's see what we can do. So at that, that time, I let them know that I would be leaving at some point and hopefully going west. And it turned out. That's a good place sort of cap back in at Reno. You went to Reno right away? Or no, here's the interesting thing. I assume once again that uh, and the, and I was wound up with one of those executive placement firms, and they were looking at SAIC in San Diego or or uh, Sandia Labs uh, or Lawrence mm-hmm. Livermore. Uh, you know, one of those would be the traditional. And the search firm called me up and said, we're going to put you in if it's okay in kind of an unusual search. I said, well, what is it for? And he said, it's Yosemite National Institutes. I said, well, what do they do? They said, they do an environmental and science education in the national parks. So I'm thinking, I'm a Soviet specialist, 26 years in the Army, six years at the Reagan White House. I'm interviewing for a, a position with CEO of an environmental uh, element that does uh, teaching using the national parks as the venue. And they said, yeah. So I was in the process. They started with 26 and it's down to 12. And then, you know, I'm not taking it seriously. Then they're down to six, and I'm still in the mix. And then it got down to three, and I'm one of the three finalists. And uh, this, this organization I, I learned a lot about. They had offices in Yosemite, Marin Headlands, Golden Gate uh, Recreation Area, and Olympic National Park in Washington. And I'm thinking, boy, that's interesting. But it's still, it's environmental and science education. And in the interviews, I, I had to tell the chairman of the board, uh, you know, Jay, I, I'm not an environmental educator. He said, we know. We need <laughs> command and control. We can hire the environmentalists. So I wound up taking over Yosemite National Institutes and uh, did that for four and a half years before coming back to Reno. You're not the normal PhD. You actually understand organizations and systems and processes. Right, yeah. And, you know, the funny thing about it, Bill, is I had done, you know, in my in my last job in the Reagan administration when I was promoted, I uh, oversaw some international science and environmental agreements. So the ozone the depletion, the, the protocol and uh, acid rain, I, I lived that on a day by day basis. So I was familiar with a lot of the environmental issues and I could em- embrace the mission of this group, which was absolutely wonderful. It Yosemite National Institutes changed lives. Where, um, 
particularly for young girls uh, who would come out into this environment and see the potential and the possibilities and the commitment to that could be made to the natural world. And it just changed so many lives. That's interesting. We'll have to go more detail. That's a, a big circle. Now, how did you get to Reno? When did you come to Reno? Um, what, what happened? You know, we, we grew up here, and at some point uh, we were thinking about coming back. Uh, there was a general named Frank Partlow who had retired to Reno, and he began a business group called the Northern Nevada Network. And uh, I'd gotten to know General Partlow a little bit, and he called me one day and said, Ty, uh, one of my colleagues, Bruce James, just got appointed to be the pr uh, p uh, printer to Benjamin Franklin of the United States. He's going back. He wants a chief of staff. He wants me to do it. I'm going to do it. Do you want to come up and take over this group? So we had a couple hours to make a decision, and we wanted to come back to Reno. So uh, at that point, uh, we, uh, 1997, we came, uh, or 2002, we came back to Reno. And that's the National Security Forum today, it's called, correct? No, 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 no that is still, I'm still, uh, uh, I still run the Northern Nevada Network. It's a okay. private group composed of CEOs or senior officials in a number of organizations. And my job is to keep them informed about everything that's going on in the civic, political uh, arenas and financial. And uh, that's totally separate. A, a few years later, a bunch of us got together at the Gold and Silver, decided we needed to get something like the Council on Foreign Relations going here. We began there. It grew, began having meetings. Uh, we went to, later to Harris, then to the Siena. And uh, because we've grown so much, as you know, Bill, now we're having over 200. I saw that. I was impressed. And it's uh, open to, to the my first. <laughs> yeah, the National Security Forum is open to the public. Uh, you, the one you came to, we had Captain Scott Tate, who's the commanding officer of the USS Zumwalt, the Navy's high-tech, stealth-avoiding, uh, radar-avoiding uh, ship, DDG. And next, we're very pleased to have um, Ambassador uh, Chris Hill, who was an ambassador to South Korea, and he's coming to Reno on September 12th to talk about uh, North Korea and what our U.S. policy should be. So it's the National Security Forum of Northern Nevada, and you can Google it, and it's open to the public. The announcements will be on there. And I was uh, very surprised. Where's it's gonna? Where's the dinner gonna be or, or breakfast? Well, uh, breakfast, right? Uh, right now we're like. right now we're temp because of some uh, recarpeting issues at the Ramada. We are at the Sands Regency on Fourth Street. It's just under new ownership. They're going to spiffy up the place. I don't know. We may be there for a longer term. The rate we're growing, Bill, with the number of people we're having, there aren't too many venues in town that can accommodate two or three hundred. I've actually I've been here four years. I've got to I absolutely say of all the things I've gone to, other than political rally, <laughs> that was the largest number of people I've seen. I've gone to an event here. Right. I was really surprised. I didn't expect it to be as large as it was. I'd heard about it. And with this, with Ambassador Hill, we'll have at least two hundred. Yeah. We've got a General uh, John Abizade coming back soon. I, I think we'll be well he's over. A good speaker, I've heard. He's a good good speaker, and yeah. uh, you may know, uh, you know, General Abizade. You may have worked mm -hmm. for him. He was well, a four star. He was <laughs> way down the totem pole. He was a commanding general of uh, all U.S. forces in Central Command throughout right. the Middle East, from Pakistan uh, yep. to Tunisia, and um, he's from this area. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, of course. I've watched him. We, my son and I, we've talked about Abizade, General Abizade. Yeah, he's he, from uh, over in, in is the California side though, isn't he? Well, he lives now in Gardnerville, but yeah, Gardnerville. Uh, what happened? He was born in the Bay Area. His dad got emphysema, and they said you really need to leave here and go into the clean mountain air. So yeah. they moved to Colville, which is nice on the area. eastern Sierras, uh, close to it's in California, mm -hmm. but I know it. because it's on the eastern Sierras, Colville plays sports in the Nevada B leagues, and so John Abizade ran track at Colville and played basketball, and their rivals would be Smith Valley or Virginia City. And now, my family's from Virginia City, and John was at Colville, and they're the arch rivals. So when we get together with Abizade, we have some problems when we talk about uh, which is the better athletic school. And that's fun. We know it's Virginia City, nope. of course. He, he just won't admit it. Hey, finishing up this interview on Meet the Voter for the RMC, I'm going to go ask some uh, questions I ask in timelines. Do you go to high school over in Virginia City? 
No, my dad did. He, gra- dad did. He, okay. he graduated from the Fourth Ward School in Virginia City, which is now a wonderful museum. Um, <clears throat> I was born in Reno, went to uh, Southside, and my kindergarten building still there is where Sierra Nevada Journeys is at the corner of Liberty and Sinclair, nice red brick building. And uh, <clears throat> then the Reno High eventually. Right. Reno High is, actually, I chose where I live here just so my girls could go to Reno High. <laughs> uh, it's good school. Yeah. And and uh, at that time, there were only three high schools, Reno, Sparks, and Minogue, one Catholic. Right. Uh, interesting, uh, Bill, Las Vegas only had three high schools. Vegas, right. Rancho, and Gorman. Gorman being Vegas Catholic. used to be small. The same size small, as Reno, right. and then of course it's uh, it's yeah. exploded. Well, in the old days, Carson City and Reno were the largest air population areas in Nevada. Yes, um, when I grew up, Reno had twelve thousand five hundred people. Wow. Las Vegas had about seven thousand eight hundred uh, eight thousand. Uh, but then, of course, uh, in the late fifties, sixties, uh, Las Vegas just exploded, and now you're well away as, as the Republican Men's Club is the. <laughs> Population is shifted oh, yes. down south. Seventy-five to eighty percent of the state's population is in Clark County, and uh, consequently, the <clears throat> politics have changed. And you know, it's it's really uh, it, for anything to be accomplished up north, you're going to have to have strong alliances with a number of Southern Nevada legislators. Right. If I were, to, we could go into that later when we come back. But that's that's a good conversation about uh, Reno, Nevada, and all those things. One last question. It's a tough one. Where's the best place to eat in Reno if I come and visit from outside? Uh, several. Can I just uh, give you a sure. few? Uh, all, for bigger places, we always love uh, the Atlantis uh, or the Legacy. Um, <clears throat> that's good. But there's a couple places I would take people to. Louise Bass Corner on 4th and Evans is old, old Nevada. I would strongly uh, always recommend that uh, people go there. For This is uh, for dinners. Okay, very good. Well, Dr. Cobb, thanks for uh, this quick pre-interview before you meet up with the RMC's dinner on the 19th at the Atlantis. I think you'll enjoy that dinner, and I think we're in for a treat. Well, uh, you know, the way the international situation is rapidly changing and President Trump's very strong enunciation of a new uh, approach to uh, perennial problems uh, in the uh, Middle East and uh, Afghanistan— and uh, putting a very heavy onus on Pakistan now, finally. Things are changing. So by the time we meet with, at the Republican dinner, uh, it could anything be, could happen. Any, a, lot could, a lot may happen. Yeah, we don't want war, but it's a dangerous world. There's no doubt right now. It's, I think it's, it is, and it's largely because of the undisciplined leadership in North Korea. And unless China takes full responsibility and reigns uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, in then I think it's a it's extremely dangerous right right now. Right, all over but, the world's dangerous. It's a lot tougher than I was when I was a young officer. I think. Uh, be, well, you know, when you and I times. were in there, there was a. Well, you were a Vietnam. Two, that was pretty tough. Two, but it was a two-dimensional world. You right. know, there there was the Soviet Union and its allies. That was our primary adversary. But the world today is so much messy. We're dealing with non-state actors that, like as various Islamic groups, either the Shia or the, the Sunni groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, complicated by the attacks by rogue nation states like North Korea and its growing nuclear capability, as well as continuing confrontations with Russia in the Middle East and with China in the South China Sea. It's an extraordinarily difficult time to have to serve in the positions like you and I were, you and special forces or me and uh, uh, policy related. Today, policy. special forces in all different countries in Af- in Africa. Yeah, well, I won't go into too much detail. Okay. No, you can't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thanks a lot, and I appreciate it, and uh, we're looking forward to the 19th. Good. Thanks again, Cadet. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for watching. Go ahead, and if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail. Go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV. And go over here, watch a couple more videos. Link to our website at republicanmensclub.org. And finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.